Beautiful day to you out there. Welcome to this business where we talk business. As we could always say, take responsibility for your health and that of your loved ones. Wear a face mask, maintain physical distancing and wash your hands regularly to uh, prevent uh, contracting or avoid contracting COVID-19. Uh, for the show today, what are we looking at? It's that time of the year where we'll begin to appraise virtually every sector of the economy and begin to make projections for uh, economic growth. So for today, we'll be looking at the financial sector and make projections for uh, the year uh, going forward. But before then, a quick look at a few stories uh, making the headlines. Uh, the exchange rate between the Naira and the US dollar closed at 414 Naira uh, to the dollar at the official investor and the exporters. Uh, window that's I and E window. Uh, Naira appreciated against the US dollar on Thursday to close at 414 Naira to the dollar, representing a 0.07% uh, gain compared to the 414 Naira, uh, 0.7 Kobo to the dollar recorded in the previous uh, trading session. Uh, Forex turnovers at the of uh, official market dropped by 37.4 percent, yes, uh, to close 139 Naira. Uh, 67 cover, uh, million rather from the 223.13 uh, million dollar recorded in the previous day. Similarly, Naira, the Naira appreciated against the US dollar on Thursday again, gaining 0.87% uh, percent to close at 567 Naira to the dollar from the 572 uh, Naira to the dollar that was recorded in the previous trading session according to our information obtained from BDC operators interviewed by uh, uh, the Naira metrics. Now, Nigeria's foreign reserve reduced by 0.08% on Wednesday, 1st December, to close $41.15 billion compared to the $41.19 billion recorded as of the previous day uh, uh, records. Now, the recent decline in the nation's external reserve is attributed to the intervention by the APEX Bank in the official uh, forex market. Now, with uh, the G20 debt service uh, suspension initiative, DSSI, nearing its term terminal date in about uh, four weeks, the International Monetary Fund, uh, IMF, has warned that the economies of some of the 60% low-income countries would collapse as from the end of this month. Now, the initiative is due to terminate at the end of the month of uh, December. The organization said uh, for many of these countries, the challenges are indeed mounting. Uh, the new variants of COVID-19 are causing further disruptions uh, to economic activities. Uh, COVID-19 related initiatives such as the G20 debt service suspension initiative are ending. Many countries uh, will face areas or a reduction in priority. Now, the body says uh, uh, that uh, it's important that uh, uh, creditors begin to agree to accelerate debt restructuring and suspend the debt service while the restructuring are being negotiated. It is also critical that private sector creditors implement debt relief on comparable terms. It says, no doubt, the year 2022 will be much more challenging with the tightening of international financial conditions on the horizon. Now, the DSSI will expire at the end of this year, forcing participating countries to resume debt service payments. Countries will need to transition to strong programs, and for low-income countries that need comprehensive debt treatment, the common framework will be critical to unlock IMF financing. Hmm. Now, the banking sector has uh, shown resilience in the face of daunting endemic and uh, pandemic constraints. Now, this is from the Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Aisha Ahmed. Now, she was speaking at the anniversary forum of the Financial Institutions Training Center in uh, uh, Lagos. Now, she expressed optimism that the sector is poised to position the country for shared prosperity within the African uh, continent. We're very positive about the resilience and the, the soundness of the banking sector. Um, you see the reports as we give them from time to time from the, um, the MPC. Um, actually, the banking system has been very um, um, strategically um, um, supported the recovery based on the impact of COVID. Um, some of the forbearances that we granted to the banking sector have, has helped 
to ensure they retain their capacity to lend and it has helped give succor to also to the obligors. And we are seeing some obligors come out of that forbearance now. The financial standards indicators have been very strong on capital, on liquidity, and we're very proud. And we just want to continue to ensure that the bank system continues to provide lending, not just wholesale lending, commercial lending, but to small businesses, because that, will be, that is the engine of the economy. Nigerian financial service sector has come with tremendous innovation in terms of product and services. We've seen technology-enabled services that makes it easy for organizations, individuals, and even businesses to do far much more. The COVID-19 experience in 2020 was a huge demonstration of how the banking sector supported all of the infrastructures of purchases, payments, digital transactions, all of that, even keeping people safe in their homes while being able to get what they require even within the comfort of their home. So it comes back to the way that the Nigerian financial service sector has totally enabled individuals, empowered individuals and businesses to be able to do more. One thing that comes out of that was, like we recorded and saw and still seeing, the emergence of several SMEs, several small businesses in the entire value chain of whether it's logistics, food distribution, every single thing became much more buoyant and they became new entrants, even like the courier companies. Logistics became a major business and revenue driver for the entire nation. Interesting position there. Uh, let's move on. The Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry, LCCI, forecast that Nigeria's economy will end its current growth rate for the year at 2.5%. Now, this was disclosed uh, by Ms. Uh, uh, Toki Mabugunje, President LCCI, at the uh, 133rd annual general meeting of the chamber on Thursday here in the city of Lagos, according to the news agency of Nigeria. Now, the LCCI chief urged, urged that uh, Nigeria's fiscal and the monetary sides of the economy should promote growth, enhancing and confidence-building policies that would encourage private capital inflows to the economy to achieve the growth and uh, also a medium-term recovery plan anchored on local productivity, ease of doing business, attracting private investment, and developing physical and soft infrastructure. Now, Mabo Kunje revealed that Nigeria's inflation would be sustained at its double-digit level in the short to medium term due to persistent food supply shocks, foreign exchange illiquidity, higher energy costs, potential removal of field subsidy, insecurity, and the social unrest in the northern region. All right, fantastic, Fia. Uh, it's that time where we dive straight into our interview segment of the show. We've been joined in our Buja studio by engineer Zakar Bala, who is an uh, 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 energy expert as well as an economist. So good to have you join us in the studio this beautiful day, engineer Bala. Thank you. Yes, quick. Um, our time is so far spent, so let's, rush as, let's run as fast as we can. Listening to the last report by the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry, they're saying that uh, the growth rate for 2021 would aspire, or rather the, the economy, the growth would end at 2.5%. Do you share that opt optimism in any way? Well, as a loyal citizen of Nigeria, I'm supposed to be optimistic. But when people are talking and uh, the figures are not adding up, I, I need to also... I mean, make my, my views clear. As far as I'm concerned, I'm at variance with those who are saying that uh, the economy is likely to grow positively. I think I would rather see, I'm seeing uh, a negative growth rather than uh, a positive growth, unless the indices change and the strategies change. I mean, look at it uh, practically as we speak today. There is, only, there is already an intention to, to deregulate the downstream sector of the Nigerian oil and gas industry. And the deregulation is going to be based on uh, imports. I mean, from that, that angle alone, you will know that, I mean, we are planning to, 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 to intentionally, as, as, as economic leaders, grind the Nigerian economy uh, to a halt, drive and move the Nigerian economy towards a cliff, and dump it into the, the valley. I mean, it is as, as practical as that. We're talking about a country where, I mean, uh, the last time we constructed a refinery was in in 1989 
from 1989 to now, you're talking about uh, 32 years. I mean, in 32 years, you have the current uh, crop of leaders. In the last 32 years, they've not been able to construct a single refinery and not to even talk of maintaining the ones they inherited. Do we need anybody to tell us that we are going to run into energy crisis? I mean, it's, it's very clear because the population was supposed to be rising, strategic industrial sectors, strategic commercial sectors, and strategic domestic sectors are supposed to be rising. And they are supposed to rely on energy to drive every other thing that has to do with productivity. And you're talking about a country of close to 200 million citizens, you know, re relying on less than 10,000 megawatts of electricity. You don't need anybody to tell you that as a country you're going to run into energy crisis. So now that we are experiencing energy crisis, I mean, it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's just shameful. Every economic growth projection, I'm telling you, is going to fall below the curve. When, we che when, when, when the military left in 1999, I mean, we thought the, the civilians were going to do better. But you're talking about 22 good years now. They've not been able to also even maintain the refineries they, they inherited from the military. Even if we were constructing ref one refinery in, 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 in five years, we'll have been able to construct four brand new refineries, but we've not been even been able to construct a single one. And for all the uh, countries like China, the US, Canada, uh, Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, that have state-owned refineries that are doing well, and we cannot even maintain our refineries. Are we telling ourselves that they are, they are stupid? And we are more intelligent so it's, it's really a very shameful projection as far as i'm concerned the economic models are, are are not the right models and if we continue at this rate sooner than later a sachet of pure water that is not more than a cup of pure water will sell at not less than 50 naira per sachet is that not grinding an economy yes. into, in, into yes. a bottomless economic speed Let's, let's, let's move the conversation further, Ejida Balazaka. Uh, which for you comes first? Uh, should we be having the conversation around um, revitalizing the energy sector or uh, we should be looking at uh, moving away from, I mean, like the world is moving away right now from fossil fuel. Here we are, we are we've not even, even been able to harness the potentials of, uh, of, uh, of this unclean energy that we're talking about. Which comes first for you? Uh, uh, potentials of the energy sector or a movement from this uh, unclean form of energy for you? For me, the first thing is for our leaders to, to accept that the economic model they are using for the country, especially the downstream sector, is the wrong economic model. Most of the people calling for this uh, subsidy removal, I heard about international organizations, most of the people talking about those things, petrol is not part of their problems. Diesel is not part of their problems. Kerosene is not part of their problems. But in the case of Nigeria, these are basic things that, that we don't have. So the, the question is, 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 first of all, have our leaders even accepted? And when you talk about drive towards cleaner energy or better energy, even the crude one, we've not even been able to manage. We've not been able to manage coal. We've not been able to manage our crude oil. We've not even been able to manage our gas, which is fossil fuel. As I speak to you today, the diesel has been deregulated. I, I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if this, your, 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 your studio is running on diesel. And you know, go to the back of your, your studio and you see the number of generators that are there. How can you break even? So when you are even talking about cleaner fossil fuel, at the moment, we, we don't even have sufficiency. I think two weeks or three weeks ago, our president was in France discussing about climate change. I mean, you, when it is a global vision, I don't have a problem with that, but let us look at our internal peculiarities. For you to move to even cleaner fossil fuel, you should be able to have the local fuel abundancy. There was a time we said people should not cut firewood. People should, should move away from kerosene. But the cost of cooking gas today is prohibitive. And cooking gas, which we technically call liquefied petroleum gas or LPG, is the first product you get during refining. An elementary refining, which is basic chemistry, elementary chemistry, we've not been able to refine locally, despite the number of technical universities we have, petroleum engineers, uh, mechanical engineers, chemical engineers, and the rest. So by the time people talk to people like me and say the, the projection is showing an economic growth, as far as I'm concerned, is not correct. 
there is nothing to show that the economy is going to grow. Rather, the policies are moving the country towards a country that will eventually put her citizens under economic slavery. Because you can also see, look at the GDP indices. In fact, let's even face it from the GDP indices. Disposable income has been eroded by inflation. So the consumption index is, is affected. When you look at the business climate hostilities, investors are not coming. Even diaspora re remittances have gone down because people are not sending monies again because there is complete business climate hostilities. If you look at the, the, the balance of trade, the balance of trade is negative. So from where will anybody tell me that the, the economy is going to grow? So you can't be talking about moving to cleaner fossil fuel when you cannot even provide basic petrol. At a point, some people were saying it is because the petrol was being smuggled. And I told them it's a lie. We are living on in, in, in the pandemic period. A micro variant has just been discovered. People are working from home. Most of the offices, including even your organization, most of your staff are all operating from home. And when they operate at home, what do they require? They require generators. What will they need to push the generators? They require either petrol or diesel generators. But, um, Engineer, that, that does not... Uh, you, of course, you're not opposed to the removal of forest subsidy. I, I want to get that clear. I'm sorry, my... I can't hear you, my something. Okay, uh, I'm sure the engineers will deal with that. Um, I did ask, um, I, I want to believe that you are, you are not opposed to uh, the removal of fuel subsidy. Uh, that for me is a very key conversation that we, we must have. Are you saying that government should remove fuel subsidy or what are you saying exactly? Okay, if you, if you could hear me well, now, uh, Balazaka. I want to believe I can hear you it, confidently. Yes. What I just want to tell you is they've been talking to us about the cost of subsidy, how much they are spending on subsidy, fine yes. and good. Let them tell us how much the cost of subsidy removal in terms of anarchy will be. Hmm. If you're just showing us the cost, then by the time you remove the subsidy, you will throw this country into social economic and political anarchy and what is that cost let them bring it and let us do the cost analysis there was a time they were they were telling us they were going to provide modular petrol using modular refineries and it was so shameful an argument because all of us know that or people who are experienced and technical know that modular refineries do not produce petrol because they are not equipped with catalytic cracking units so when you see leaders blatantly talking like that you keep wondering and my expectation is that anybody who aspires to become a political leader must first of all be a very good economic manager there was a time they were also banditing i mean banding some some lies that is is the rich that 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 that, uh, that benefits but i can tell you many people you think are rich in nigeria are actually bloody debtors because recently there was what we call insider trading in a legendary bank and many of the people we thought were rich go and check they are all bloody debtors they are even responsible for the collapse of financial institutions in the country but let us even assume they are rich let's assume a rich man has five cars one car for himself and driver they drive another car for the nanny and driver another for the children the maid and ma madame if they decide to increase the price of, of pms such that uh, the ogre will, will be punished. By the time the ogre sacks all those five drivers, will government provide uh, employment for those drivers? There was a time again they were just talking about trying to provide some amount to 40 million people. As far as I'm concerned, more than 170 million Nigerians are extremely poor. Nigeria can best be described as a big country with a huge population and expanse of land, but it's a very wrong model for people to copy. Look at the insecurity in, in the central part of the country. Just assume that every farmer, every farmer or a youth will cultivate just 10 ridges of harvest. At the rate, you have thousands, hundreds of thousands of youths that have been pushed off because of insecurity. Just imagine the number and millions of ridges of harvest that Nigeria is losing. 
So when you have leaders that cannot think as economic leaders, you can't come up with projections that people like me will accept. We will always respect them as our leaders because God put them there. We will pray to God to give them wisdom and guide them. But if they come up with, with issues and pronouncements that are not adding up, we have every legal right as legal citizens to technically and practically challenge their thinking and thoughts. Uh, Balazaka, I'm, I'm sure you, 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 you just have some level of, um, some tint of optimism somewhere for our country, uh, just maybe if we can get to do the right thing. I'll put you on the spot right now and ask you to begin to make possible suggestions uh, that could take us as a nation, the economy, out of the quagmire that we seem to have found ourselves. In three minutes, uh, Balazaka. The first thing is for our leaders to accept that we are on the wrong economic trajectory. There is no shame in, 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 in making mistakes. If you are a good father or a good parent, open up to the children and your children will support you. Then the next thing is the biggest mistake we are making and thinking importation of finished goods when we have the raw material here is going to bring us out of the woods. That will not be possible. In fact, as I'm speaking to you now, even the OPEC quota that has been assigned to Nigeria, Nigeria has not been able to meet up with her OPEC quota. Libya has overtaken Nigeria. Then look at even the price of crude oil. And I think, to the best of my knowledge, the benchmark price for, for the 2022 budget is about $57 per barrel. Just look at the price that went to almost 80 but we couldn't even produce the quantity that we need to meet up with OPEC quota. If we have been able to even do that, that will help us to breach the, the deficit. So it's very clear certain things are not adding up. Our leaders should come up, and in national interest, let us remove politics, let us remove sectionalism, let us remove sectarianism, and in national interest, provide a solution. Because people like me still see a situation where Nigeria can be the political, economic, and continental hub for Africa. But if we don't fix things internally, even the African continental free trade area advantages will elude us. I think that is such a perfect place to end this conversation, but I could guarantee you that it is going to be a rolling uh, conversation until we get it right as a country. Thank you so very much for your time with us on today's business. Definitely we'll come back to you again for more anal analysis in the future. Angela Balazaka, uh, energy experts and, and economists. Always a pleasure talking to you on, on the show. No worries. And God bless our great country, Nigeria. God bless us all. Okay, okay. That's where we call it a wrap on the show. A fantastic conversation we're having there. Unfortunately, time would not allow us to take any, uh, go any further. That's our show today. So we'll come your way again next time from all of us here. Have yourself a profitable business day and bye for now. I am David Babudike. Mm -hmm.